Good morning to the Honorable Ministers of the Council, members of the media, radio listeners via St. Martin Gov Radio 107.9 FM and other radio stations and online viewers. I'm Rolaika and welcome to the live Council of Ministers press briefing for today, Wednesday, August 29th, 2018. At this time, I invite the Minister, the Prime Minister and the Minister of General Affairs, the Honorable Leona Romeo Marlin to address you. Prime Minister. Good morning, everyone, my colleagues, those who are listening via this means of media. On Monday, August 27, the Parliament approved the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, NRRP, as well as a temporary ordinance on the National Recovery Program Bureau. Together with the members of the Interim Recovery Committee, I made a presentation to Parliament and answered the members of Parliament questions and concerns. The NRP is a knowledge-based document that was prepared by more than 170 national and international experts. The experts collected, validated, and analyzed data on the damages, losses, and needs of the same of St. Martin in the aftermath of Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Based on numerous site visits and consultations, the NRRP quantifies the recovery and resilience needs in 18 different sectors. In the coming years, the NRRP is expected to continue playing an important role in the planning and preparation of projects. As of today, three grant agreements have been concluded with the World Bank to finance some of the most urgent projects that are identified in the NRRP. A total amount of 102.7 million US dollars has been allocated from the trust fund to projects that serve to address some of the most pressing needs of the people of St. Martin in the coming years. The availability of these funds is extremely encouraging after almost a year of uncertainty about whether and when the promised funding would become available. Having said that, we all know that preparing and allocating funding are only the first steps towards actual recovery and reconstruction projects. Implementing these projects will take a lot more than money and goodwill. It takes time, capacity, material knowledge, labor, and undivided attention. With the establishment of the National Recovery Program Bureau, this government, with the full support of Parliament, recognizes the need to strengthen the government's implementation capacity. Later this year, when the law on the Bureau enters into force, the National Recovery Program Bureau will operate alongside the existing government organization and will become responsible for the implementation of the projects that will be financed by the Trust Fund. It will take time, more funds, and the continued patience of our people, but this government remains very committed to accelerate the different recovery and resilient projects, regardless of whether they are financed by the World Bank, insurance proceeds, the European Union, or the national budget. Via this medium, I would like to thank all members of the Interim Recovery Committee and the members of Parliament who participated in this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for your opening remarks. At this time, I invite the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sport, the Honorable Wyclef Smith, to address you. Minister Smith. Thank you very much, Ms. Roach. I would like to say good morning. Good morning to the press, to my colleague ministers, to the members of the Department of Communication, to people watching and listening to this press briefing. Good morning, St. Martin. The Sport and Creative Industries Open House, which took place last Friday and Saturday, August 24th and 25th, 2018, at the Raoul Illich Sports Complex, was a great success. Hundreds of students came out on Friday and saw and experienced 
the various extracurricular activities that are available on St. Martin. These activities included, among others, basketball, boxing, soccer, kickboxing, kayaking, cycling, as well as several other sports. From the creative industries aspect, there were exhibitions such as uh, Zumba, aer aerobics, craft, drum band, and other creative activities. On Saturday, the Sport and Creative Industries Open House continued, and hundreds of youngsters and adults came out to witness and experience the many activities and events. And to close off the event, the organizers from the departments of sports and culture invited government officials to participate in a 60-meter sprint followed by a 60-meter speed walk race. The lineup of sprinters included, among others, Minister of Finance Perry Heerlings, Minister of VSA Emil Lee, Member of Parliament Ardwell Irion, and Head of the Department of Sports Janelle Richardson. MP Irion finished the race with a clear 10 meters ahead of the rest. Minister Lee came in second, with uh, Janelle Richardson following as a close third. The final event was the speed walking race. This race is one where St. Martin has taken home medals from the Special Olympics. Track coach Les Brown explained the rules of this race to the participants, which among others were Minister Emil Lee, Minister Miklos Hitterson, and yours truly, as well as Member of Parliament Artwell Irion. When Minister Hitterson came into the race, I knew that was it for me. <laughs> How could I compete against the youth and such long legs? <laughs> Unfair competition. So yes, I came in last. <laughs> but I got all the chairs. All in all, it was a great event, and I'm looking forward to participating again next year, God willing. And Minister Hiddison, I challenge you. <laughs> As Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, I would like to thank all the organizers, booth holders, participants, schools, attendees, and the general public for coming out and making this year's event the success that it was. The collaboration between the departments of sports and culture was the brainchild of Ms. Janelle Richardson, head of the Department of Sports, and Ms. Clara Reyes, head of the Department of Culture. Indeed, St. Martin has much to offer our youth and the community at large in the sporting arena and the creative arts. And so I encourage parents to have their children engage in extracurricular activities as these kinds of activities boost their development socially, physically, as well as mentally. Continuing with sports, right now in Barbados, our national netball team is participating in the regional qualifiers for the 2019 International Netball World Cup. These matches will determine who d represents the region in the 2019 Netball World Cup competition. This will be the 15th staging of the premier competition in international netball contested every four years. That tournament will be held from 12th of July until the 21st of July 2019 at the Echo Arena in Liverpool, England. St. Martin has played three of the seven matches thus far in Barbados, all with a lot of heart. We won our first match and lost two, currently standing in sixth place. However, win, lose, or draw, our girls are already champions in our eyes. They have set St. Martin on the map in this sport, and it warms my heart to see our flag held high in the region. They are definitely our ambassadors. So let's keep cheering them on. I just want to bring to your attention that last Thursday, August 23rd, 
was the International Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its Abolition. The man who we recognize today as being a front runner in the abolition of slavery is Toussaint Louverture of Haiti, who said, and I quote, it is not a liberty of circumstance conceded to us alone that we wish, but it is the absolute adoption of the principle that no man born red, black, or white can be the property of his fellow men. In 1791, approximately half a million black slaves, 30,000 white plantation owners, and 28,000 mulattoes occupied the western side of the colonized Hispaniola. With the recent turn from aristocracy in France and the attempt to gain equality for mulattoes being squelched, the fire was lit in the majority of the population to fight for their freedom. And on the morning of August 23, 1791, Saint Dominique was awakened to the revolution that changed the course of history by becoming the first black people to rid themselves of the bonds of slavery after hundreds of years of transatlantic slave trade. The Republic of Haiti paved the way for the rest of the Western world to rise up against this inhumane system. Gradually, the fever of the Haitian Revolution spread throughout the region. Even here on Sualiga, the French hold broke on the north, and our brothers and sisters on the south side demanded their freedom as well. Abolition was the beginning of one step which constitutionalized our liberty. It is now incumbent on us today and in the future to treat each other with equality and dignity. It is now incumbent on us to look after the welfare of our neighbors, our elders, and our children with a strong sense of fraternity. We must do these things to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. Only then would we have freed ourselves and mark August 23rd as a day, solely as a remembrance. August the 1st is widely celebrated as Emancipation Day throughout the Caribbean region, and we too join in those celebrations. And as we come to the end of the month of August, let us not become complacent in our ambitions for liberation. Instead, we must strive to be free in enterprise and advancement. We cannot call slavery abolished until we have broken the chains that, that bind us mentally. We must move forward together in the spirit of brotherly love and unity. Let us continue to support one another as we build a better St. Martin. This past Sunday, August 19th, I had the honor and the privilege to welcome back home a son of the soil. He left St. Martin in, 20, in 2006 as a young student with study financing, and he returned 12 years later having earned two academic degrees. I'm talking about Dr. Engineer Damien Jonas Adolphus Wilson. Dr. Engineer Wilson started off at the Methodist Agogic Center, after which he went to the St. Martin Academy. Then with the aid of study financing, he studied at Cambridge in the UK. He also studied at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, where he obtained his degree in biomolecular engineering. He then went on to do general medicine and surgery at the University of Zagreb in the Republic of Cro uh, Croatia, that's in Southeast Europe. Dr. Wilson was a valedictorian of the St. Martin Academy in 2006. Alongside his dedication to medicine, science, and research, Dr. Wilson is a former St. Martin Junior Minister of Tourism 
and a former member of the St. Martin national debating team. His accolades are numerous, but let me end by quoting Dr. Wilson, who said that he regards family as his greatest source of inspiration and strength, together with his faith. He said that it is family and faith that have guided him throughout his life. Dr. Wilson told me that he's very happy to be back home and he's looking forward to putting into practice the best of his experiences that he acquired abroad in order to serve his people and his country. St. Martin, we must be proud of Dr. Wilson and others like him who return to serve their people and this country. Such successes make us as a people proud. Such successes give us hope in the for the upcoming generation. Such successes will also motivate and inspire our young people to strive and to achieve and be the best that they can be. Dr. Wilson is a study financing recipient from the St. Martin government. Having just presented the law on study financing last week in Parliament, Dr. Wilson's accomplishments in the fields of engineering and medicine tell me that St. Martin is on the right track with its law on study financing, which will offer financial aid to many more students to pursue their dreams and to accomplish great things in the field of academics, the arts, and sports. Let me say to our students, if you are motivated to pursue a profession or a career and you meet the requirements, the government is there for you through study financing to help you achieve your goals. Congratulations to Dr. Wilson's parents, David and Chantal Wilson. Congratulations to his family and friends. And of course, congratulations to Sualiga. St. Martin, your son has returned home and will soon be beginning his practice at the St. Martin Medical Center. Congratulations, Dr. Wilson. Where were you on September 6, 2017? Well, I'm sure that we were all sheltering from Hurricane Irma and praying for her to go away as quickly as possible. Yes, we all have memories of the destruction and havoc we are all affected in one way or another. Our country suffered severe destruction. But you know what? We are resilient and we are bouncing back and we are building back better and stronger. That's what we do here in St. Martin. So next month, September the 6th, 2018, as a nation, we stand still. We will pause and take two minutes to reflect on the passing of Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria. We will, we will reflect on lessons learned, battles won, challenges that we overcame, and the disappointments and fears that we have conquered, because we are all overcomers. In order to acknowledge what happened on September 6th last year, we're going to observe two minutes of silence. Yes, two minutes of silence. Just to remind ourselves that indeed, it is possible to rebuild better and stronger just as we did after Hurricane Lewis 23 years earlier. During those two minutes of reflection of September 6th, we will also honor our brave. We will honor our first responders. We will honor our many unsung heroes, and we'll honor ourselves and the ones we lost during the worst hurricane ever in the Atlantic. So on Thursday, September 6, 2018, at precisely 9.06 a.m., the government of St. Martin is asking everyone in the country to stop for just two minutes. We're asking the public and the private schools all businesses and all government entities to stop, pause, and reflect. Come to a complete standstill and offer a moment of silence to the nation in reverence 
of all that we have been through. If you are in traffic, pull over and be still. We're asking store owners to close their doors in the tradition of the old, as when a funeral procession would pass and the doors of the business would close out of respect. We're asking radio stations to pause for two minutes at 9.06. We know also that in The Hague, our Ministry of Plenipotentiary will be joining us in our silent 9.06, two minutes. I'm also sure that many St. Martiners abroad, as well as friends of St. Martin abroad, will be sharing in those two minutes with us. You may ask why 906? Nine represents the ninth month, that's September, and six represents the sixth day of the month. So wherever you are on 906, remember that at 906 a.m., St. Martin will pause and stand still to reflect on our resilience, our strength, and our recovery and on our determination to rise and rebuild stronger and better. We ask that you record that moment. It can be a photograph, a video, or an audio recording, and share that special moment with the rest of St. Martin. The government's Department of Communication will be compiling all of those moments to eventually to be able to share them with the rest of St. Martin and the rest of the world. At the end of the two minutes pause and reflection, our Honorable Prime Minister, Mrs. Leona Marlin Romeo, will address the nation via the airways, via radio, TV, and live streaming. We invite you, encourage you, beg you, and implore you to join us on September 6th at 9.06 a.m. to reflect on St. Martin and how we overcome the worst hurricane in history. We have and we shall continue to overcome because as St. Martiners, we are overcomers. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Smith, for your opening remarks. At this time, I invite the Minister of Public Housing, Spatial Planning, Environment, and Infrastructure, the Honorable Miklos Heterson, to address you. Minister? Thank you, Ms. Roach. Prime Minister, fellow ministers, press, and audience members viewing and listening, good morning to you all. I would like to start off my press briefing by informing and reminding the general public that the road paving, road patching program for 2018 would be starting this week and is scheduled to start tomorrow, Thursday. Due to equipment being down and we've, be, we've been experiencing some delays, sorry. <coughs> but we are slated to start tomorrow, Thursday. I ask motorists to please exercise caution as these works move through the various districts. It is the ministry's intention to complete these works in as prompt a time as we can, and we'll try our best to disrupt traffic as little as possible. In the coming weeks, the schedule will be distributed to the public via the media so that they can be properly informed. Last week, Wednesday, the ministry held a National Spatial Data Infrastructure or NSDI consultation session here at one of our conference rooms. And this was a consultation to review the proposed approach for St. Martin with, with key stakeholders all in one room. The proposal was presented by Ms. Valerie Grant, the Managing Director of Geotech Jamaica. And among those presents, present were GB, Telem, UTS, the Fire Department, Cadaster's Office, the Ambulance Department, and the Chamber of Commerce. One of the main goals of the consultation was to discuss the importance of sharing each organization's GIS layer with each other in order to create maps with more accurate and detailed information for the island. Though I could not stay for the entire session last week, I received positive reports of the discussions. One of these 
one of which was the consensus that at this point, the Vrami Ministry would lead as the centralized location for GIS development efforts. I would once again like to thank the, organiz the organizers, presenters, and participants who all contributed to a successful event. This weekend, I was able to check in on the progress of some of the homes under our pilot roof repair program. This program, which is funded by the national budget, started approximately three weeks ago and is scheduled to conclude in the next three weeks. All of the homes chosen belong to pension age residents. There was admittedly a delay in the start of the program, but we are now moving ahead. The program serves as a precursor to the larger roof repair program, which is being funded as one of the early recovery projects. That larger project is at present being coordinated between the Ministry of Rumi, the Ministry of VSA, and the World Bank project managers. In closing, we continue to monitor on an almost daily basis the activity of the garbage haulers. Those not living up to the terms of their contracts are immediately sent warning letters, and there have been instances where separate haulers have been hired to clean up, and that money has been deducted from the delinquent's haulers contract. This will all, of course, be taken into consideration when the new contracts go out for bidding. In this post-IRMA era, as we continue to recover and clean up our island, I urge residents to not continue to add to the problem by littering and throwing garbage just on the side of the road. Please, St. Martin, this is not who we are as a people, and let us keep, continue to keep our island clean together. This concludes my press briefing for today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Heatherson, for your opening remarks. At this time, I invite the Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor, the Honorable Emily Sojasi. Minister Lee. Good morning, St. Martin. Good, good morning, fellow ministers, um, those listening by radio, television, or internet. Um, a couple quick points. I'd like to, first of all, congratulate um, St. Martin and uh, the people of St. Martin and the SMMC. Um, with the opening of the eye care clinic at the SMMC scheduled for September 3rd. Um, the eye clinic is going to be opened with state-of-the-art equipment and a team of capable specialists. So, you know, every week we seem to be making progress towards our goal of delivering quality health care close to home. So I'm very happy with this next milestone. And I think it's important to recognize, actually, there's a number of specialties that have been added or in the process of being added. So while the ophthalmology department is scheduled to um, begin operation in September, the urology department has been operational as of the fall of 2017. Uh, so that started just uh, not too long ago, just after Hurricane Irma. Um, it's important, and when we went to a conference, when the urologist was speaking there, actually he indicated he's already booked three months out. So in other words, there's quite a bit of demand, and he's obviously doing quite a good job, and I've heard very positive feedback from the community. Um, orthopedics has actually started already as of February of this year, but with very minor surgeries. One of the things that's required for the orthopedist to do more is for repairs to the operating theater to be um, uh, to take place. And actually those repairs to the operating theater are scheduled to begin. Um, this is actually part of the money from the World Bank grant for the SMMC. So besides strengthening the current hospital to resist hurricanes and supporting the construction of the new general hospital, there's also some upgrade or repairs to the operating theater and this is to improve the functionality and make sure that it allows that more complicated orthopedic surgery can be um, done here in St. Martin. And the projections are that the neurology department by the end of 2018, so by the end of this year. So, you know, we're adding a number of services to the SMMC. This is all, again, in line with our goals of building the new general hospital and delivering quality health care close to home. 
I think it's important to recognize, though, that this increase of services, there's a number of contributing factors that are critical for us in order to be able to execute it. Number one was the money for the equipment and for the services, actually, and that's partially due to um, a loan from the Bass Islands of $2 million, and that loan obviously is going to be paid back by sending their patients from Seba and Stacia to use the facilities here in St. Martin. So obviously for them, it's better that they send people to St. Martin rather than sending them farther abroad, just like for us, it's closer to home. And so by using the services here, that also contributes money into our economy, of course. It also means that they can treat their patients closer to home where they very often have family and friends here. Um, the other thing that, that helps, of course, like I mentioned, is the contribution from World Bank that helps to improve the services of the operating theater and the facility itself. The other thing is, a, you know, there's been some discussions about the tariff adjustment for the SMMC. And I think it's interesting to put it into perspective. The tariff adjustments that we're talking about that were put into place um, will only bring the tariffs for the SMMC up to where Sejos was, the St. Elizabeth Hospital in Curaçao in 2004. So if you remember the history um, before 101010, Sejos was considered, the St. Elizabeth's Hospital was considered the general hospital for the Antilles and the SMMC was designated as a peripheral hospital. So for the same operations, for the same procedures performed in the two different facilities, the SMMC was always structurally underpaid by roughly 30%. So the adjustment in tariff actually only brings us up to the level what St. Elizabeth's Hospital was getting in 2004. And imagine now they're building a new hospital and adjusting their tariffs to pay for their, their services. So I think that we're being very efficient, very cost effective. We're talking about simply bringing it up to a level that it was in 2004. The other thing is, um, you know, when you compare what the costs for the procedures, so the, the SMMC with the old tariff, for every procedure they were performing basically lost money. So therefore, the more services offered, the more frequency that those procedures were actually executed, the more money they lost. So obviously, it's not rocket science to figure out that adding services and adding functionality to the, to the hospital, to the SMMC, was a losing proposition. So by adjusting the tariffs, it means that the services they provide actually are at least break even and hopefully make a little bit of money as well so that they can continue to invest in the hospital itself. And of course, when you look at it, the tariffs by making the services available here, we talk about the reduction of referrals abroad. So while we, when we send people abroad, we are not only paying the cost for the medical procedures, we are paying the travel cost for the patient, we're paying the travel cost, so that's air, hotel, and per diems, and then we're also paying those same expenses for the companion who's going with that person, and then of course the medical bills, and then, of course, the fact that we're sending our people to a country that's foreign to them. They don't have the support network that they have here. So um, obviously care is different than when you have that care at home when you have family and friends around you to support you in your recovery process. So again, congratulations to SMMC. Congratulations to the people of St. Martin. Again, we're making strides in terms of delivering quality care close to home. Um, a couple other quick things I'd like to touch on. Um, I did have an inquiry from one of the media houses about food safety inspections, asking some statistics and asking for some specifics about particular insti insti institutions, um, businesses. We don't give specific information about um, different establishments. We give generalized information. But just to provide some, some information, um, between January, and January to June of 2018, 766 inspections were performed. 323 of those were routine inspections based on the regular schedule of Horeca and also mini and supermarket, mini and supermarkets. And 443 inspections related to food related advices, complaints, investigations, auditing of food establishments, etc. How many of them were closed? Seven restaurants were closed between January and June of 2018. And then obviously once they corrected their um, infractions, they were allowed to reopen. And on another note, I've seen quite some discussions, especially on social media, about the labor inspectors. 
about the need for controls, and I want to assure the public that those controls are ongoing. There are a number of investigations in process. The ministry is a bit short-handed in terms of labor inspectors, so, but they are out there doing their job. The last thing I'd like to touch on is our um, reintegration facility in Sucker Garden. Last updates um, as of now, from the 43 persons that moved over from Festival Village, 28 of them have been successfully reintegrated into the community. We do still have space, so people who are in need of shelter, they should contact the Dr. J Foundation. They can reach out at 520-4747 and they will be guided through the application process. Um, this also dovetails a bit into the Ministry of Vromi in terms of the roof repair project. As we're going through some of the roof repair projects, obviously some of the people may need to move from their homes while the repair process is in place, and the shelter is available for those that need to have a temporary place to live while the repairs to their homes are um, ongoing. And that's my report from the Ministry of VSA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Lee, for your opening remarks. The Minister of Justice is present, however, will not be making any opening statements, but is available for any questions the media may have. We now go on to the question and answer session. Alisa Singh of the Daily Herald, you have the floor. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Alika. Good morning to the Prime Minister and Ministers of the Council. Prime Minister, you just received a petition from a sizable group of us. Uh, Samaritan residents. Um, have you had an uh, occasion to glance at, I'm sure they've been um, advertising what their um, goal is. How feasible do you think those goals are and how quick do you think that any of those can be enacted? Thank you, Alita, for that in-depth question. Um, if I understood, the, the first stop that the petitioners made was to Parliament. That is um, provided for them um, by law, and they have executed such. It is actually up to Parliament to make the decisions. Once Parliament make that decision, then I, I believe then Parliament will instruct the ministers on how to further proceed or what's the wishes of Parliament. I believe that is usually how the process goes with a petition. So that will lie in the hands of Parliament. Minister DeWeaver. Thank you. I know some of the issues are directed towards the justice uh, chain. Uh, you know, we have to remember that there are the separation of the legislative branch, which is parliament, the executive branch, which is the council of ministers, and the judicial branch. Uh, these separations of powers must be maintained and be clear of each one's responsibility. Each branch should and work most efficiently and effectively. And I think that should be the general understanding and make sure we don't blur the lines too much. Thank you. Thank you, Minister De Weaver. Lyndon Brown, BCNTV, you have the floor. Good morning to, good morning to the people of St. Martin and to the wonderful minister today. Time to time, you're going to hear me say, um, I'm going to be thanking people. I want to thank Dickham. A lot of time, a lot of times, these people, uh, workers of government are doing great job, but you don't hear nothing. And they are quite capable, so I take it into my hand to congratulate this staff for doing a great job. To Minister Gittison, there have been a misconception of a parcel of land in St. Peter's. The, the Rasta man, um, Mr. White, um, it has been surface in newspaper but th there is a misconception because um, the people do not understand the story. Um, you come and meet the problem with the, with the land. So I need you to clear the air, let the people understand directly that this is not your problem. This was a problem before, and I know the story. So clear the air and let the people understand what exactly happened. Mr. Brown, please note that that was not a question. Oh, that, that was not a question. Can you please ask the minister a direct question so he minister, understands? Minister, there was some controversy with the land, with Mr. White. Um, it had been said that um, the Richardson family had the land for years, and they have title to the land. But somehow, Mr. White 
find himself on the land without any formal document from Vroomi. And um, from your office, he wrote, he wrote a letter to you, he, he wrote a letter, and um, the conversation was based on agriculture, that Minister Gittins do not believe in agriculture. So there was a misconception in, in the whole issue. So let the people know what's your understanding and the basis. Thank you for the question, Mr. Brown. I don't really understand the whole, well, what you're saying is not 100% true. So um, the, the clarity that you seek is, uh, I can't really talk about it because it was also recently in the, in the court and there was a court ruling recently. What I can say is that I am not against any agricultural project. In fact, I champion any agricultural project that's, you know, that's being, that wants to happen or that's being, that is happening. And right now I'm in discussions with Mr. Wyatt. So maybe the public will find comfort in knowing that me and Mr. Wyatt will be sitting down shortly to discuss exactly what and how he can continue. But there was a court ruling, yes, that he must um, demolish the buildings that he built there illegally. Yes, that I can say. Thank you, Minister Heatherson. Stephen Cerulean of PJD2 Radio, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Roach. Excellencies, good morning. My question is for the Minister of Health, um, Emily. Um, many of the island's patients are so often flown to the Dominican Republic, Colombia, Aruba, and Carousel for medi medical, medical care. Um, we know of the agreement um, signed between the Cayman Islands and LZV. Is that uh, agreement still ongoing, and how frequently um, does persons travel to the Cayman Islands for medical referral? Thanks, Stephen. Um, I think the, the agreement that you're speaking about with the Cayman Islands was with um, Health City. And remember, it was a pilot project because the, the issue with Cayman is flight connectivity. You know, um, basically, I think you can either go via Jamaica or basically you have to go via Miami, in which case, and that's the most reliable and, let's say, frequent uh, flight is via Miami, in which case we run into issues with um, immigration issues going via the United States. And so the challenge uh, that we had with Cayman Islands was really about how we get our patients there. And so they started with a um, charter flight. It was a, basically a medical charter flight. It was a, it was a pilot project. Um, ultimately, the, what we found was it was difficult to keep the numbers in a sustainable and regular pattern to make the flight viable. And so um, from my understanding, while I don't have specific numbers, I don't think the numbers are, are that substantial anymore going towards Cayman. I think it is really much more via, remember we send people to Aruba, Curacao, and then mostly Dominican Republic and to Colombia. Wasn't there some sort of a direct flight from St. Martin to uh, the Cayman Islands? And that was a, the charter flight. That's the flight that I'm referring to. So there, there was a direct flight. And number one, when we went with the charter, it was um, a twin propeller plane. So the flight was a little bit long. The plane was a little bit restrictive. Some of our patients are um, a little bit on the larger side. And so especially when they were going for medical reasons, they found that the seats were not very comfortable. So basically for logistical reasons, there were challenges maintaining that regular flow of, of volume of patients towards Cayman. There may be still some patients going, but it's um, not in the volumes that we were looking at because of the logistics. So the charter flight is not operational. It was only for a few weeks as a pilot to try it. Thank you, Minister Lee. Alita Singh, you have the floor. Thanks again, Olaika. Minister Geeterson, uh, I believe uh, two or three weeks ago you announced the um, a road improvement program in some areas. Uh, my question is, what is the current situation of the overall road network? And do you have um, a 
estimate on how much it will cost and when and how will you get money and start that overall up upgrading? Thank you for the question, Alita. Um, the current status of the entire road network is deplorable. It's very bad. The whole network needs to be resurfaced. The exact cost we do not have as yet because it's most of the road network on the Dutch side, especially the main roads, have to be completely resurfaced. The we the budget that we have for this year um, is what we will have to work with and do as much as we can with that budget. It was my intention to execute works every four months, but seeing that we had some setback with the finances, and I understand that the airport in Saba is also being worked on, and that's the same equipment that we use here on the island. So we are experiencing delays because of those factors, but the exact budget I would have to get back to you with. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Hiedersen, Linden Brown. Question to Minister Lee. Minister Lee, there, are some, there have been some crowding. Are this appointed with some people that um, have to go abroad for medical purposes? Like for instance, um, somebody have family in the Dominican Republic and they will request, I want to go to the Dominican Republic. And the, the, the office of Z, SZV will say, no, we cannot, we, we, we cannot, this, your complaint, you will have to go to Colombia. And the people are discussed, they, 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 they are not happy with, with such. Um, but so far, what I understand is said that if they want to go, then they will have to pay some of the, the expenses. So please clear the air so that the people of St. Martin could understand the procedure. Okay, um, thank you for the, for the question. Um, first of all, for, for clarity, just so we're clear, the, the Ministry of VSA and the Minister does not get involved in the, in the particular decision and of individuals in the referral process, right? So I am um, keep more of a policy perspective, okay. One. Two, um, the amount of complaints that I receive regarding the referral process is tremendous. So while, you know, while I'm not directly involved, obviously I have an influence and people call me and complain and, and explain to me their situation. So let's, let's first address the fact about the referral process, right? The, time that it takes to get an answer. I know that sometimes it's very long. Um, people maybe they disagree with the outcome of the decision about the referral. In other words, do, you know, if someone says, no, you need to do it in St. Martin or you need to be referred abroad, goes to the issue you talk about whether you be referred to Colombia or to Santo Domingo, um, or some say, I want to go to the U.S. And so, so everyone has an opinion um, about where they want to go, where they want to receive the, the care. Um, so it is an issue, and I want to be sure that the public understands and that the media understands we are looking very critically at the referral process for SEDV and how we can streamline and improve that entire process, one, okay? And then to your specific request about um, patients, let's say, giving input in terms of where they want to be referred to, SEDV looks at things from a medical perspective. They have relationships, they have contracts with different providers, they have different pricing, and, and um, when they look at the patient, they look at it from a medical perspective in terms of where they believe the best quality of care for the best price can be received. I understand that there may be instances where people say, look, if you send me to Dominican Republic, you don't need to pay for my hotel, I'll stay with family and friends, and those are all things that they should make sure they explain to the um, to the SFV because in the end, if those, um, if that support, in other words, if that family support is there and helps to change the formula in terms of what the costs are, those are things that SFV can take a look at. So, but if it's just I prefer to go to Colombia because I've never been to you know Medellin, obviously we're not paying for vacations, right? This is for medical care. Thank you, Minister Lee. Stephen Cerulean, you have the floor. 
My question is for the Prime Minister in charge of general affairs in the absence of the Minister of Finance. The month of September is fast approaching. The budget was supposed to have been sent or will be sent as stated to Parliament by then. I think it is September the 15th. Um, how far ahead is the finance ministry in that they are able to present the budget to Parliament? S Stephen, I'll jump in because actually I'm uh, filling in for the Minister of Finance. Um, if I recall, and perhaps PM you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if I recall the, the Minister of Finance had announced publicly that he was not going to make the September deadline based on um, some of, as he got into the Ministry of Finance and finding that there was a lot of um, things that needed to be clarified and rectified, that he anticipated that he would not be able to make the September deadline and was looking at towards later in the year being able to submit the budget to Parliament. If, uh, yeah. So that's all I know. I don't have a firm date for you. I know he's working on it diligently, but I know he's not making his September deadline. Thank you, Minister Lee. We will now move on to the final round of questions. Alita Singh, you have the floor. Thanks again, Olaika. Prime Minister, uh, last week you made what some considered a pretty strong statement in support of, of, of um, a member of parliament and leader of the United Democrats, uh, Mr. Theo Heiliger. One of the biggest questions in the community is, have you been contacted by anyone in The Hague, particularly the, the Dutch State Secretary, Mr. Knops, about that um, strong statement, and if there is any indication that The Hague is unhappy with the current uh, support that's out there uh, in considering that it's an ongoing um, criminal investigation. Thank you, Alita Singh, for that question. In short, no, I have not been contacted by the, our, our, by the Hague. Um, no one has indicated anything to me from the Hague as it relates to the public statement about the leader of the United Democratic Party. Um, indeed, I made a strong statement, but I think my statement was well balanced. I hope that um, it was received as such. Note must be taken that at the end of the day, I am the Prime Minister of St. Martin. I do have a responsibility for the entire country. And at the same time, I am appointed by the same leader from the United Democratic Party. He is my party leader. So I believe that my statement was actually a proper balance between the both roles that I play as a prime minister and also, and also as a member of the United Democratic Party. But note is to be taken that I stand by my statement. And again, that does not mean that the government is going to interfere in any case that is um, being conducted by the prosecutor office. However, we would like to see that uh, all things that need to take place take place within a within a proper time frame. Thank you, Prime Minister Lyndon Brown. To Minister Smith, um, the the ministers and the member of Parliament had the opportunity to had a sport day uh, days Friday and Saturday. Could you tell us what was the outcome so far? Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. I think I did that at the beginning of my statement. I gave an outline of what took place. Uh, but um, in short, uh, it was an exhibition of various sports activities and uh, creative uh, events and activities so that the children, students, and the general public could see what St. Martin has to offer in those areas. And I also indicated that uh, at the end of the open house on Saturday, uh, there was a competition between uh, officials and uh, I was one of the participants. Didn't win the race, but I did come in. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Smith. Stephen Cerulean, you have the final question. And my final question is for the Minister of Romy. The road repair and resurfing program will start as of tomorrow, Thursday. Um, can you tell us as to which of the roads will be um, resurfaced? 
starting tomorrow. Thank you for the question. Um, we will be focusing on the L.B. Scott Road as one of the first roads to, for the project. Sorry? This time, the schedule, the schedule time, I don't know. Last, sorry, last week you asked me about time also. I couldn't give you a proper time. I will get back to you with the proper time for tomorrow, though. But they are starting tomorrow. We are slated. Hopefully everything goes well as planned, and we do start tomorrow on the L.B. Scott Road. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Heaterson. Honorable ministers of the council, members of the media, radio listeners, and online viewers, this brings us to the end of the live Council of Ministers press briefing for today, August 29, 2018. For rebroadcast, tune in every evening at 7 p.m. on St. Martin Cable TV. For video on demand, log on to the official government's website at www.stmartingov.org. On behalf of the Department of Communication, I'm Rolika Roach, and do have a pleasant day further. <laughs>